Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, our Christmas series of programs continues, and today we're going to bring you a bit of a rarity. Uh, This is an episode of Shirley Temple Time, the uh, radio series that starred Shirley Temple. There are only two episodes of this series that are circulating, and this one uh, came just right after Pearl Harbor. So it's rare, and the sound quality is not the best, but I think you'll enjoy the story nonetheless. The original air date on this story is uh, December the 19th of 1941, and the title is Christmas for Two. It's Shirley Temple time. makers of Elgin watches, familiar symbols of Christmas cheer and gaiety, bring you the third in a series of four, the sweetest present in the world, Miss Shirley Temple. Thank you, Truman Bradley. Hello, everybody. Well, Shirley, been keeping busy, have you? Oh, you know how it is before Christmas. Mm-hmm. I was in a play at school and shopping and wrapping presents and everything. So you have a real old-fashioned Christmas, I take it. Oh, sure. You trim the tree and arrange the lights. Mm-hmm. And then you uh, hang your stocking up. Oh, no. What? Well, now tell me, aren't you going to hang up your stocking, Shirley? No, I always hang up Mother's. It's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shirley, I hope you find it crammed to the very top with all sorts of good things. Oh, I have the best thing of all right now. Well, have you? And what is it? Oh, that shouldn't be hard to guess. Isn't the star of MGM's Dr. Kill Bear's uh, victory here? I mean, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Uh, You know, you're getting to be a veteran of radio as well as scream. Seems to me you've been in pictures a mighty long time. Well, pretty long. I started before pictures had bank nights, but you go back further than that. Considerably. Sometimes I think I started before they had cameras. But, you know, I've heard a lot of wonderful comment on the job you're doing here, Shirley. In times like these, doing your bit to make people laugh and enjoy themselves. Sure. Any American would do that, Mr. Barrymore. Do you think they'll close the schools? Of course not. Not a chance. That's what I was afraid of. But Anyway, I know one school that will be closed. Yours. Mine? Oh, I mean the school you run in our play tonight. It's going to be closed up tight for Christmas, you see. You're the headmaster, and I'm a student, and... My goodness, there's the bell. Come on, we've only got one minute. Hold on. Well, what happens to that minute? Don't worry. Truman Bradley will take care of that. Mm. Thank you, Shirley. All Broadway knows Helen Menken for her great stage performances in Seventh Heaven, The Old Maid, and many, many more. Radio listeners know her hit dramatic program, Second Husband. Miss Mankin is also a noted style authority and was judged the best-dressed woman in radio by the Fashion Academy. A collector of sketches and painting, Miss Mankin has always encouraged American art and design. She was delighted to see the new Lord and Lady Elgin watches and said, I think the new Lord and Lady Elgins are lovely. They show such refinement in style and beauty. But I know of no better example of American leadership in the world of design. Yes, and you'll say the same thing when you see the new Elgin watches at your jewelers. Here is a gift worthy to say Merry Christmas from you to the one you love most. And you can be certain that your Elgin's beauty is more than case deep, too. Assured of accuracy by Elgin's 77-year-old tradition of fine craftsmanship. The best recommendation for true precision comes from the United States government itself. For national defense, Elgin furnishes a large percentage of the precision instruments required for Army, Navy, and aviation use. Yes, proof of Elgin's excellence from the acceptance tests of the United States government. And remember, every single part of every Elgin is made and assembled in America by American craftsmen. 
many of them the fourth generation to make Elgin watches. Before Christmas, visit your jewelers. Choose the watch of distinguished styling, unequaled precision. Your gift of an Elgin watch can bring lasting Elgin watch. Little girls boarding school on the outskirts of Boston. Shirley Temple is Raleigh Thornton, one of the students and not studying very hard at the moment. You see, it's noon of the day before Christmas, and Ronnie and her roommate are eagerly preparing for the vacation. Hey, Pam, you're finished packing already. Help me close my bag, will you? When's your dad coming for you, Ronnie? I hope he comes early. I've got to get a present for the house, Mother. Huh? I gave her my present already. You did? What? I put a frog in her bed. Gee, I wish I'd thought of that. Hey, you can't close this bag like it is. You put too many things in it, Ronnie. Well, gosh, I only packed what I absolutely need. Well, you don't absolutely need a ski suit and a bathing suit bowl. <laughs> you don't know my dad. But he's full of surprises, he is. You start out for Lake Placid, maybe, and all of a sudden you're down in Florida. Anna? Oh, sure. Last Christmas we flew down to Palm Beach. We had a whole plane just for our party. <laughs> what kind of a Christmas party is that? On a plane. Well, it wasn't a party exactly. Just Buddy and me and those three men from Hollywood. Movie stars? Mm-hmm. One of them was even in a picture once. Once I heard Buddy say that... Gosh, do you always call him Buddy like that? Your own father? Well, I mean, right to his face? Well, sure. Everybody calls him Buddy. Don't you ever read the papers? Yeah. Gee, I wish my dad would do something to get in the papers sometimes. Maybe he ought to get married more often, like Buddy does. I don't think my mother would let him. <laughs> Nobody tells Buddy what he can do. Gee, I bet he's super. What's he like, Ronnie? I mean, really. Well, you know old Beetlepuss? Sure, I know him. Well, you think of somebody like him, that's old, and his mustache is like gray spinach, and his clothes are all baggy, and they're mostly never pressed. Uh-huh. And he's always mad, and his voice is like he ran it through a potato grater. But gee! And then you think of somebody just the opposite, and that's Buddy... Gosh, you had me worried. Who'd want to spend Christmas with anyone like old Beetlepuss? <laughs> I bet he doesn't even know it's a Christmas. Veronica. Come in, Flora. Paul, oh, for you on the downstairs fall. Is it Dad? I was just leaving. I have to get home and fix my tree. Flora, is it my Dad? Uh, no, the headmaster. Beetlepuss. Wants to see you in the office right away. <laughs> I'm coming for Ronnie. Yes. Don't stand there like a wooden doll. You've been in this office before. Yes, sir. Rather often, I recall. Yes, sir. Too often, in fact. Yes, sir. Can't you say anything but yes, sir? No, sir. I mean, yes, sir. I guess I just got sort of excited, Mr. Beetleson. Undue excitement is a sign of ill breeding. Rule four in the conduct book. But everybody's excited today. I mean, a child leaving for Christmas. The teachers and everybody. I don't believe I'm excited, and I'm certainly not leaving. You mean you're staying here? All alone? Gosh, on Christmas. Ah, Tweedle's final. Well, Mr. Beetleson, if you don't mind, I'm in a sort of a hurry. You see, my dad will be here any minute now, and... Mm, you're always together for the holidays, are you? Yes, sir. Of course, sometimes there's other people along. Once there was a man with a trained seal, and last year... I was... don't think we need review your father's whimsicalities. Whimsicalities? Oh, never mind. I've just had a wire from him, Veronica. From Dad? Yes. Seems he's been um, delayed. You mean he isn't coming today? It isn't he? Isn't... Gosh. Now what? Uh... Tomorrow's Christmas. I'm quite aware of that. But you don't understand. All the stores will be closed. And if Dad doesn't get here till tomorrow, we can't go shopping. I'm sure you'll get your quota of gifts. Oh, I don't mean for me. I mean for Dad. He always helps me pick out his present. That's what makes it fun. Gosh, I'll have to get into town today. Mr. Beetleson, this car. My car? Oh, ridiculous. You can't drive a car. Well, I ran a motor scooter once. <laughs> I scarcely say that was adequate preparation. But I've got to get to town. I'm sorry, Veronica. Maybe if there was someone to take me... I'm afraid all our staff will be gone. But, gee... I think we'd better let the matter drop. You can't drive yourself, and there's no one else to take you. But Dad will be here tomorrow, and I... Wait a minute. I know. No, you don't. Don't look at me. But if you don't take me, I'll have to go myself. I'll have to walk all the way to Boston and back. And I'll have to tell my dad. And he'll take me out of school. And he'll get it in the papers, too, and... Papers? 
Plymouth School is ever in the papers. It will be if I don't get Dad's present. All you have to do is drive me in. Gee, will you, Mr. Fiedleston? Well, under the circumstances, I'll follow up words. Most commonly reserved for hoodlums and gangsters. Yes, sir. I'll thank you not to use it again. Yes, sir. Even at the risk of limiting your vocabulary to yes, sir. Go on, get your hat and coat. The way those steam shovels work? Confounded nonsense, standing here in the slush and snow. But I always watch the steam shovels when I'm with Buddy. Buddy? Who's that? My dad. Your father? But aren't you being slightly informal? Well, gee, a person can be informal with my own dad, can Uh, well, if he doesn't mind. Oh, no, sir. Everybody calls him Buddy. One of his minor foibles, no doubt. He thinks they're very important, steam shovels. Once he said that you could always find a steam shovel at the foundation of society. What do you think he meant? I'm sure I couldn't possibly unravel your father's social concepts. Oh. Besides, my feet are cold. You should have worn your galoshes. Galoshes. That's the trouble with this generation. It's soft and flabby. No spine, no dignity. Why, when I was... Hey. Oh. Hey, you better stand back there, little mister. Don't get too close to the edge. I'll stand when I choose, sir. Now, look, buddy, I'm only trying to... My good man, I'm not your buddy, and I refuse to be ordered about. But I'm only... I know my rights as a citizen. This is a public thoroughfare. I'll stand here till next Christmas if I wish. Well, it's okay with me. Come on, Louis, speed it up. You want to get done early today? Gosh, I didn't mean to start any trouble, Mr. Beetleson. If you really want us to go... Not one inch, Veronica. I won't move the smallest fraction of an inch. I'll stay right here. Get down! I'm sorry, Mr. Beetleson. I didn't mean to knock you down. What is this? Some new sort of game? Flushing at me like a maddened bull? I won't have it, you hear? If you just get up like... I won't tolerate this sort of behavior. It's unladylike. Undignified. Gee, that, that was pretty fast thinking, girlie. If you hadn't knocked the old goat down, he'd be playing his Christmas carols on a harp this year. <laughs> Smell nice in here, Mr. Beetleston. Oh, I love a flower shop. Ah, uh, Tiddlesfoto. I still don't know. You dragged me in here. Well, your feet were cold. And anyway, Buddy always wears a flower in his lapel. Ridiculous. He says he wouldn't forget his carnation any more than he'd forget his his. His what? Well, I can't say it right out, but it's a very important part of his suit. Hello, folks. Oh, Nick is very happy for to see you. Nick, that's me. Well, I'm Veronica. Mostly people call me Ronnie. And this is Mr... There's no need to turn this into a social function. All we want is one carnation. Oh, sure. That's nice. I bring him out. Wait right, just a minute. How much are they? Carnation? He's at 45 cents each one. 55 cents? Why, uh, that's outrageous. Look, my friend. And I'm not your friend. And look, my not friend. That is the price, and that is what you pay. Nick, can I pick out the carnation myself? Oh, sure. Go ahead. He's in box. Oh, I love buying flowers. Oh, that's nice girl, mister. He can sue you very crazy for her. Oh, eh? uh, here, yeah, my friend. Oh, now you want for it to be, my friend, eh? Now, now, that's just a form of address. There's no implication in social equality. Hey, that's very nice. I like that. Sure. You, you buy her a mighty swell present, I bet you, eh? Ah, I haven't bought a Christmas present in years. Ah, oh, but such a pretty girl. You better get him something, yes? How would I know what to get a girl like that? Oh, that's easy. You just ask him Santa Claus. At my age? Don't be silly. Oh, I don't mean I fell on his sled. I mean in department stores. Say, you know everything. That fella, he's pretty... Shh, quiet. Here she comes. I found just the right one, Mr. Beetleson. Do you like it? Well, isn't that color a little blatant? Oh, no, sir. It's just pink. Well, let's be getting along. No, don't, don't move. <laughs> First you pay me. Yeah, then, then you give a little kiss, eh? I said? Kiss? Hey, what do you think is that up there? That's mistletoe. Mistletoe? Sure, eh? Number one, the best. But, gee... No arguments, please. But, gosh, what do you think, Mr. Beetleson? Uh, well, since it seems to be inevitable. Oh, that's very nice. I like that. Come on, little girls. You're going to kiss him now, eh? Well, I guess so. 
After all, a person can't waste your time, can I? And we've got our shopping to do, and... Well, he said himself it was ineffable. But, Jay Williger, I know what I want to get for Buddy. Why do I have to talk to Santa Claus? Well, I believe that's the conventional thing on Christmas. I know, but if I already... Besides, if he might have some suggestions for your present. If you don't know who want to talk to him, I'll talk to him myself. Well, if you want to talk to him, that makes a difference. Come on, he's right over here. Tommy will do everything you say and be such a good boy. Won't you, Tommy? <laughs> yes, of course you will. Thank you so much, Santa. Come along, Tommy. Got your home. Uh, may we have your attention, Mr. Uh, uh, Claus? <laughs> you don't have to be so formal, mister. Just call me Santa. <laughs> You're not the real Santa Claus. Well, I guess you've got me there, little girl. But you know, the real Santa Claus is pretty busy these days. <laughs> he can't be everywhere at once, can he? So I'm sort of an assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now we got that settled. Well, now we... I don't want a doll. Gosh, I'm too old for dolls. And anyway, I know what I want. Yeah, what? A solid gold shaving set. A solid gold... I don't believe it. <laughs> now, look, little girl. Those dolls I'm talking about... I believe it's evident she doesn't want a doll. But it's right here in the book. Trains for boys, dolls for girls. May I ask why you keep on insisting on a doll? We're overstocked. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is ridiculous. Now, wait a minute, pal. And I'm not your pal. Oh, oh, oh now that's not nice, mister. <laughs> Talking to Santa Claus like that in front of the little girl. <laughs> You're going to ruin her delusions. And you, her own father, too. You're not Santa Claus. And I'm not her father. Well, her grandfather. I'm not her grandfather. All right, her great-grandfather. And that's as high as I'll go. <laughs> I could do better than this by just going over to the toy department. Maybe you better, Mr. Beetleson. I don't think he understands you. Mr. Beetleson, we've been through this toy department twice already, and you keep talking about that little girl, but... Gee, you don't get her anything. I am a doll. I'm afraid she's a bit too old for dolls. Oh, how old is she? Well, I I believe they call it the awkward age. Oh, that's such a difficult age, isn't it? I remember when I was... Please, Veronica, keep on thinking. I am. Maybe if you tell me what she's like, I can... Oh, well, she's pretty much like any other girl. Sometimes she's bad, and sometimes she's good, and sometimes she's... Veronica... You better not play with that train. That's a very expensive toy. Well, if it's a toy a person can play with it, can't I? Well, that's no ordinary toy. It's a highly perfected electrical mechanism. I know, but... But you can't handle it just casually. You have to know how it works. Now, take this switch. This starts the cars on the main line, you see? This one, this is for those freight cars on the shuttle. This one locks the junction on the main line there. You see that it's clear? Marvelous. Look at the way those signal lights work. And the way those mail bags are lifted off. But, and off. gee. Huh? I guess. You're playing with that train and you wouldn't let me. Huh. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. Gee, a person would think you never had a train. Oh, I haven't. You mean never? Even when you were young? No, not even when I was young. But didn't you even want a train? I was concerned with more serious things. Now, come along now. We've still got to get your father's place. Let's try the... I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, sir. Can I help you? I don't believe so. Oh, this train set would make some child very happy. It's only $50 and... Only $50. Oh, well, if you're looking for something less expensive, I have a perfectly marvelous novelty here. This midget radio. You see, it's made like a book. You just open the cover and it starts and to play. You have a wonderful You like it, do you? And by the way... Buddy Thornton is doing his share to keep society a gun. Buddy! I'll take that, Jack. Wrap it up. Even to his no, old wait. friends, he has just added a new chapter to his career. Buddy eloped this morning with several towns. Flying to Florida in a chartered plane, the wedding party. Well, you don't have to close it so vigorously, sir. It works very easily. Are you just... Take it away and wrap it up. Yes, sir. Will you want to get a package with ribbons and seals or packs? Has a right to be happy on Christmas. 
Sure, everyone. Everyone ought to be happy. Everyone. Hey, Ronnie, 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 come here. Come back here. Ronnie? Ronnie. <laughs> You're the head of this call. I demand that you do something. We're doing everything we can, sir. Ah, Mrs. Martin. She's been gone for almost an hour now. If I were a younger man, If I... she were younger, too. I mean, if she was six or seven, maybe. I'm sure she'd turn up in the lost and found. But a girl of her age... Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, hello? Yes? You have? Well, that's fine. Yes, right away. Thank you. I believe they found her, sir. Oh, thank Where? A north wing main floor. She's in the toy department. Why did you run away like that? Well, you don't like to see me cry, and I just had to cry, and, well, so I went away and cried. You know what, Mr. Beetleson? How should I know what? Without knowing what I'm supposed to know what about. Why did you come back to the toy department? I, I thought maybe you might forget the radio. You know, for the awkward age. It's all packed and everything, see? Don't you think it looks... Where is that idiotic salesman? Oh, he'll be back in a minute. He just went to... to... Gee, I bet that girl will love this radio. It's such a wonderful present. Oh, she can have so much fun with it. Oh. Well, I hope you do. Oh, I know it's your... Me? Did you say it was for me? I didn't say it. I inferred it. But it is. You mean, all that time you were looking for a present for me? Only I didn't know it, and now I find out that... Ah, uh, uh, Ronnie, remember undue excitement. Oh, guys, what do I care about rules for right now? I never was so happy in my life. I think you're the nicest, sweetest, kindest... Well, there man. you are, Miss Thornton. I've checked uh, with the delivery, and we can create a train set and get it out by six. Now, let me see if I have the right address. Uh, it's going to the Plymouth School for Girls to a little boy named Homer Beetleston. Uh, uh, <laughs> it is odd, isn't it? Uh, well, I'd better go and get this order right in. I'll be right back. Uh, you shouldn't have done it, Ronnie. Spending all that money... Well, I like to play with trains, too. And anyway, Buddy didn't need that shaving set. He has a silver one and... Gosh, you're sniffling. Uh, I... I must have picked up a cold standing in that slush. It's all arranged, Miss Thornton. That delivery will go out as promised. Thank you very much. I'll be in again sometime. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Miss. Uh, that radio... Oh, uh, she's not trying to steal it. Charge it to me. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, your name, please? Homer Beetleson. Uh, Homer Beetleson. Oh, I say, you're ribbing me. Homer Beetleson is a little boy. Uh, well, what do you know? And to think he's been shaving for over 40 years. Mr. Beetleson, listen, can you hear singing? Of course I can. It's a Christmas carol. That's over and listen. Homer Beetleson. Homer Beetleson. Come, 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 my good friend. If you're going to keep your mouth open that way, you might as well tell us where we can find those singers. Uh, yes, sir. Christmas carolers, main floor, east wing, first aisle to the right. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? I don't think it ever sounded lovely. Why don't you sing? Oh. Oh, Mr. Shirley Temple and Lionel Barrymore in an original radio play, Christmas for Two. Now... Here is our young hostess bringing her guest back to take a bow. Oh, well, that was grand, Mr. Barrymore. Well, you liked it, did you? <laughs> well, have you know, young lady, that I thought you were right spanking good yourself. You kind of surprised me. I heard those other programs of yours. Oh, didn't you like them? Oh, yes, of course I did. But then the girl's likely to do a lot better acting with those good-looking young leading men. So you... Those were mighty nice presents you gave those fellows, too. Oh, you heard about that? Mm hmm. Did you? Bob Young showed me his watch just the other day. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm, yes, yes. You don't happen to have the time on you, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Won't do any good to him, Mr. Barrymore, because I'm going to give you a Lord Elgin watch anyway. See? And on the back it's engraved to LB, time from the stars to a star. Well, bless you. Thank you, Shirley. It really is time from the stars, too. This Elgin Observatory certificate goes with it. 
just as it does with all Lord and Lady Elgin, to prove it's tested for accuracy. Oh, what's that Elgin box in your hand? Did somebody else give you one? No, Shirley. This one's for you. Oh. A Lady Elgin, with your name on the back. It's a Christmas present that the makers of Elgin watches ask me to give you. Oh, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, and it has an inscription just like yours. And, oh, and what lovely diamonds. Oh, I'm so pleased. I... Uh, I know you'll keep it for many years, Shirley. Just as I will mine. They'll both remind us of this Christmas time in the year 1941, when a very young lady came of age as an actress. Good night. But I couldn't go without thanking you for Mr. Barrymore and myself. It's lots of fun doing these shows, and I'm so glad there's still another one to come. Guess who's going to be here next week? Humphrey Bogart, with a gun and everything. But mostly, we'll have a lot of laughs, and I hope you'll all be back again. In the meantime, I'd like to say a merry, merry Christmas to you all. And remember, give as much as you can, as soon as you can, to the Red Cross. They need money, and they need it very badly. Good night, everybody, and thanks. Don't forget, next Friday night, another gay half hour with Shirley Temple, Humphrey Bogart, and William Arch and the orchestra. Same hour, same station. Be sure and set your Elgin watches for Shirley Temple time. Truman Bradley speaking for the makers of Elgin watches, the world's finest time basis. This is New Orleans, WWL, Loyola University of the South, with studios in the Roosevelt Hotel. They are on parade, 59 varieties of Philip's delicious canned foods, inviting you to test them and compare their quality and flavor. Welcome back. Uh, Really a very sweet uh, Christmas story, and I think just the perfect two people to play the roles. You know, Lionel Barrymore, at this point in his career, was practically uh, specializing uh, in the uh, curmudgeonly characters. And then, of course, you have uh, Shirley Temple to play the role of these two people of very different generations who find themselves alone together on Christmas and really can help each other uh, even though they wouldn't uh, even think of admitting that they really need each other. So it's a very uh, nice story. One thing I will comment on uh, for one of the advertisements, when uh, you have an advertisement talking about how someone is the best-dressed person in radio, I'm kind of like, what is the relevance of that? Uh, You're the best-dressed person in radio. Why should anybody in radio care? We can't see you. I I mean, that's like, you know, announcing that somebody was awarded the best-smelling person on television. In fact, when you listen to modern radio drama actors, the one thing that they say they love about doing audio is that they can show up in whatever they would like to wear. Uh, The late Jacqueline Pierce, when she was recording for uh, audio dramas for Blake Seven and Doctor Who, went to uh, do the recordings, you know, wearing a coat and her nightgown. So this is a bit of an odd idea that's really just specific to this era. But at any rate, a really nice episode, and it, I, I hope it puts you in the Christmas spirit. And we will be back on Monday with the third episode of our Christmas series, so be sure and listen then. If you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>